just uh, a disclaimer before starting. Um, my definition of fun may be a bit different than yours, but thanks for falling for my clickbait. And uh, who am I? Uh, it's a good starter. Uh, I'm. Uh, th these are some fun facts about, about me, just in case you need to start a conversation at the social. I wasn't at the yesterday's social because I was preparing those slides. Uh, but so I'm Brazilian. I'm living in London since February uh, this year. I used to be a runner. I'll, I'm a cat person. I work in IT since 2004-ish. I had like some career changes now and there. Uh, but today I'm a software engineer at uh, the data infrastructure team at GoCardless which someone may call a data engineer as well. And OK, so what you should expect for this talk is, first, of course, we are talking about pointers. So I will define what are pointers. We will see a bit about how memory works, uh, just enough for uh, which you understand how pointers work, and when to use the pointers, and when not to use pointers. But the whole idea about this talk uh, started when I was maybe a couple months ago talking with a coworker of mine, and I was talking how Go is such an amazing language, so fun, and you have all those features and stuff, and he said this to me, um, Go, I don't know, it has pointers. And usually people think that, oh my god, pointers, that's so like 90s or 80s, I don't know, uh, it's so old school, we moved past, uh, past over that for like a long time ago. Why do we have pointers nowadays? And, but that made me think. So it's kind of why do people uh, are afraid of pointers? Why do they have this kind of prejudice? And when I started coding, I used to, start, uh, I used to code in C and C++, and I was used to see things like this. And... For those who are not used to, to C, you, you can actually, even for, for, for those people that are used to C, that's really hard to re read. Uh, enough that someone came up with a rule to hit this kind of syntax, that's the clockwise spiral rule by David Anderson. And the whole idea to read this, you need to follow the lines. And by, by, by the ASCII art of this slide, you may know how long ago this was made, like how dated this is. And okay, I'm I'm not going to make you follow this uh, through, uh, but you can trust me that this uh, function says uh, it's a function called signal that's passing an int and a pointer to a function passing an int and returning nothing, returning a pointer to a function that passes an int and returns nothing. And you can see that. This is not readable at all. It's not natural for us to read this kind of thing. And just for the sake of curiosity, how do, would, do, uh, would that uh, looks like in Go? And it's kind of this. So func, uh, uh, signal is a function that takes an integer and a function that takes an integer and returns nothing, and returns a function that takes an integer and returns nothing. And this is kind of a tricky example because I didn't need the pointers at all to express this in Go. So um, the bottom line of this is that people are usually afraid of, of pointers because it introduces a lot of complexity in the way you think about programs. And if you look at it in, the, in detail, it's not just about this confusing spiral syntax that produces low readability, but also in C, in the older language, uh, pointers could have like dirty values that eventually you forgot to initialize a pointer and you get some, some uh, you, you see yourself accessing some kind of memory that you were not supposed to, and then you get like, get like a segmentation fault. Uh, you also had confusing syntax like uh, array variables without indexes uh, were exactly the same thing as the pointers. You had pointer math that you can, could easily go out of the bounds of your memory limits. Uh, you had to use pointers to handle memory allocation, and you had to deallocate that for yourself. And that uh, would often lead to like no point interceptions, sec faults, all kind of crazy errors, unpredictable errors. And how Go did solve this uh, issue? Uh, first, we have like a cleaner syntax. You can read uh, Go language from 
uh, left to right, like a natural language. Pointers are initialized to nil, uh, so you have like a clean uh, initialization value. Um, arrays and pointers and slices are different things, although slices have a pointer to array, uh, an array inside them. Uh, there's no pointer arithmetic uh, except when using like the unsafe package. Uh, like we're going to talk about this later. And we have the really nice garbage collector that handles allocation the, alloca the allocation for us, so we don't need to worry about allocation the allocation. So uh, that relieves a lot of that complexity I was talking about earlier in C and C++. But getting a bit uh, deeper into that, what are pointers? So pointers are nothing more than variable that store the address of another variable, and they do enable us to use uh, what's called the pass by reference semantics. And it's really important to, to, to consider that pointers are not references, and I'm not going uh, too deep in details about that, but there's this excellent article about, uh, from Steve Francia that details this, but the caveat is in a reference, you can't, as uh, uh, after you created it, you can't assign it uh, to a new, uh, to reference another thing, and you can do that with pointers. If you assign a value to a reference, you are sh changing the actual value, the original value, so it works more like an alias. Uh, while a pointer, it points to something, and you can change what it points to uh, during its life cycle. So we have those two nice operators, this I will call it star operator because I, uh, English is not my native language. I don't know the real name of this. But, and the ampersand operator. Uh, so the star is, we call it dereferencing because we're actually accessing the value the pointer points to. And the ampersand operator takes the address of something, so effectively it's creating a pointer to that thing. And, but what if I told you that there is no pointers? So Please bear with me, uh, and I, I will explain what I'm, I want you to say about this. So first let's start with this very simple example. We have A equals to one, so I'm creating an integer variable with value one, and every variable has an address and a value. And in the line 11, I'm creating B, that's a pointer to A. So how B looks like? So the value of B, is the address of A, but B itself has an address because it's also a variable. It's a variable like any variable, uh, any other variable. And so I have C now that points to B. And okay, the value of C is the address of B. And C also has an address and so on with D. And you can go crazy and do this as much as you like. So Please don't do that. But yeah, I was trying to break the thing, the thing and actually this compiles. I was surprised by that. So this is a value like anything else. And this example uh, proves it. Uh, so let me show you. I have um, a very simple code here. I have, I'm creating a pointer to an integer. And the answer is always 42, of course. So this pointer answer points to an integer that has the value of 42, and I'm kind of destroy. To destroy this answer, and I'm assigning it to nil. Okay, so I'm effectively uh, saying this pointer is going to be nil. So if that w uh, was a, actually a reference, when I try to de the reference answer here, I'll get a no, no pointer exception. But that's not the case. Why? Uh, I, they are. Uh, it is the same the address, is the, is the same value, but the thing is that something is not the same pointer. And the way to see that is just taking the address of both of them, and you see that they have different address, so actually we are talking about different variables, not the same variable. Both variables point to the same thing, but they are not the same variable. Uh, so that means that pointers are passed by copy as anything else. Um, if you actually wanted to do this and destroy, you needed to, would need to like, have a pointer to a pointer, and then you need to assign this value and pass the address of answer, and then you effectively 
create the new pointer exception because now I can the reference and change the actual pointer. So what I want uh, to show you here is that pointers are values like anything else. And we also, we have this really nice theorem that says that we can solve any problem by introduction, uh, introduction an extra level of interaction that's attributed to David Wheeler, except of course for the problem of too many levels of interaction. And this is the fundamental theorem of software engineering. So when you need a pointer to a pointer is actually when you need to change the value of a pointer because otherwise you will only be uh, dealing with the copy. And this is another example is almost the same thing, but then we have like a pointer receiver and let's see how this works. So we're expecting, uh, I'm taking like a structure here and I'm assigning it to new and I'm expecting this to explode. So, but it doesn't, why it doesn't? Uh, actually, th this is the very same example, it's just that we are not using the same syntax, but uh, this is uh, exactly the same as uh, if I, I write this thing here, so I'm calling, um, now I'm calling the exact function with a, a pointer parameter. And so when you call a receiver method, it's actually a syntactic sugar, uh, sugar to this kind of uh, form. So th we have like, struct goes boom is just one method of the method set of my little struct. So uh, here I'm just calling it directly. And the first argument is the receiver. And a, ni a nice way to see that is that um, taking the address of M, uh, both, uh, both of them have different addresses, so they are not the same variable, it's a copy. Uh, so uh, the point is, when you need to do that, if you need to change, of course, in this case, you may think, okay, let's add another, another level of interaction and that doesn't compile, so it not, doesn't work, so don't do that, uh, it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, the, the idea is just to show that pointers are passed by copy like anything else. And that's also why we don't have constructors in Go. Because here we are trying to call the method create, see if the pointer is new, we're creating a new person. Uh, no, simply no, that doesn't work because you are actually changing the copy of the pointer. That doesn't make any sense. So when I say there is no pointers is you should think about your pointers as, as values as well. They are copies of the other values. So if you need to change them, you need a new level of interaction. Um, but some of you may be still thinking about that crazy Z value that with lots of stars over that. And the first time I, I thought, okay, well, how many interactions can we have? And apparently there is no limit. So I decided to do some, uh, use some BigQuery magic and also the power of regular expressions and try to query the uh, GitHub public data set to see how uh, is this kind of structure actually used. And it happens that it's really difficult to find, uh, to like search in code for uh, any number of stars because people use that a lot in comments and strings. So I try to do some cleverness here to, to see uh, uses of it. Of course, these uh, repos are not uh, like the whole thing, they're just samples. And what I found is you have some code, like crazy code like this, but the really the good news is that I only found this in tests and most of them were about encoding and decoding in drivers. So this is a part of the standard library. And so I made an explicit uh, query to, to see what's a test and what's not. And so in this particular case so with four uh, levels of interaction, I found like a, a 1,200 files, but, and the not test ones were actually um, test data for an issue in the Go uh, language. So actually, thank God we as a community are not using that kind of craziness. Uh, with three stars, you will find a lot of more uh, code, and two stars is uh, very common, but it's mostly for uh, driver codes and low-level stuff. And so 
when do we actually need to use pointers? Um, I tried to find uh, some quotes to, for you to not say, hey, Daniela said me, and maybe I would say something wrong. So, but I couldn't find anything except this excerpt from the Golang tour that talks about pointer receivers, not exactly pointers, but it's kind of like the same sense, so just I'll show it to you. And the first reason to use a pointer is that you need to modify the value, so you're leveraging the uh, pass by reference thing. Uh, another um, reason is that you want to avoid copying the value, and that could be for performance uh, reasons, but the highlight here is the word can, uh, because it's not always the case, and I will show uh, this in a moment. I would add to those two reasons. Uh, another reason that's more common probably in my field, that's data engineering, is when you need to differentiate like the zero value of something with the absence of that value. Uh, and that's very common. You can, like in data sets, you can have missing values, but you can also have zeros. How do you differentiate that? So, uh, in this case, like having like pointer a new pointer can be something that is desirable. Um, this example is, uh, uh, let's first talk about when I need to modify things. This comes um, from my um, tutorial, like the Pac-Man tutorial. Um, I can talk about this later. But anyway, uh, I have an array of ghosts. And I had this, this was actually a bug before I realized in this, that I was raging to each go, uh, toward each ghost in that slice, and I want to update their positions. And of course, this doesn't work. And the thing is, um, here, when I'm ranging over something, uh, and the hint is here, I'm creating a copy of that value. So I'm copying G. And of course, the, the position will not be updated. And um, a quick solution to that would be to make everything a pointer. And this is actually, Nowadays, my preferred solution, oh, sorry, but. So uh, this way I can modify, it's G will still be a copy, but then I can modify things. Um, another way of doing this would be just raising uh, to the index of things and modifying it in place. But from someone coming uh, from Python, uh, I think I'm introducing like an, a variable just for indexing. I don't like this kind of construct. I think the other one is clearer even by using pointers. So they, this may be a matter of style, but I prefer the other way. Um, another example that was uh, a bug uh, in a code that I was writing. Uh, I write a, tend to write a lot of bugs. So I had a custom uh, marshalling uh, code. In this case, the doesn't anything custom, I just for the sake of illustration. So I have this code that's trying to marshal some string to the JSON, and by running it, it doesn't produce the result I was expecting, and the, it's a single character bug that if you need to change something, you need actually to have a pointer to it. So um, when, think about that when you're going to define your uh, uh, receiver methods. If you want to de define on the copy or a pointer, is basically when you need to change something. Um, but then there was this uh, interesting scenario, and uh, just to get you a, uh, give you a bit of context, uh, at GoCardless we're trying to we're building a tool that will take schemas defined in YAML, and we need to convert to Avro. Avro is a uh, schema definition uh, specification that's based on JSON. And I oversimplified the example here, but trust me, this was needed. Um, and the idea is, I have a schema that has a list of fields, and a field that has a name and a type, and some of them had a default value. And for a matter of compatibility, I, I didn't want to print like the default value uh, for fields that did, didn't have one. And we had other kinds of, of properties here, there that we need to omit, depending on the type of the field. And luckily, we have this omit empty struct tag that allows us to omit the fields that we don't want to print. And this works um, really nice. Uh, sorry, I'm struggling with a bit. So this is the code. OK, default is lazy. But then I had, at some point, 
uh, this scenario, I had actually some schema that was defined and I need the default to be null. And, but if the value of default is null, uh, the JSON uh, marshalling omits that result and I need to explicitly say that. And I was thinking, oh, oh my God, how I solve this? And luckily um, I had watched it like a, probably a year ago, a talk from Francesc Campoy that uh, explain about how interface behave differently uh, in types. And there is this thing that new sometimes is not always new. And you, you, this, there's this particular case with interfaces that interface not only have values, they also have a type. And if a, a, a completely new interface is a, that has a new type and a new value. But you can have like an interface that holds some type and a new value, and that's not entirely new. And so uh, eventually I did this, and this was really hacky. But so now instead of having just new, I'm defining an empty struct. I it didn't matter what type I was uh, placing there. I just needed to, for the, the JSON marshalling to ignore that tag. So then it's not new anymore, and my default is no. And you see that a lot in some error handling codes. That's what uh, the Francis talk uh, was all about. But yeah, this is a bit hacky, but it's an interesting use case for non uh, new interfaces. Um, so we talked about um, when we need to modify values and about when we need to make differentiation about empty values and uh, absent values, like uh, zero values and absent values. For the next part, we're talking about performance. And when we need, to, we, we don't want to copy values when pass reference to it, but it's useful to have like a refreshment on memory before that. So uh, how does memory work? Let's think about your machine. You have like the main memory. You also have your program memory that's the, let's say this part of the memory that your program use that's allocated to your program. And this memory is divided in, in two things. You have the mostly two things. You can have a few more segments, but mostly the code segment, that's where your code lives. And you have the data segment, that's where your data lives. That was, was, is why they are called this way. Um, in the data segment, you have the heap. And the heap is uh, like a place where you can allocate random objects of different size uh, by any reason you need them. But you also have the stack, and that stack is a specialized structure that has like this uh, really nice property of you, you add values, and the last value uh, is the first one to come out, so you, you push things in the stack and pop out things of stack. Um, and the most uh, fun way I, I've thought about and, uh, to understand this, uh, how a stack works, is using some plain old assembly code. Um, oversimplifying things here, but uh, let's say I have this instruction push. AX and DX are registers, CPU register, but could be a memory location. And that arrow is where my program is running. So every time I send push, something enters in the stack. So I'm pushing the value of AX and the value of the X, and then I'm suddenly at this call function. Call is like when you actually need to call something, and you can notice that it doesn't have any arguments. And the way you pass arguments uh, to functions in assembly is through the stack, uh, eventually, but uh, you can use also registers. But if you need, once you go more into details, you need to read the CDECO specification or any specification for the given language. But let's make this simple so everyone can follow. So I have the call um, function, and I have an, a pointer to where I'm in the code, and this, the, the, the other is defined by the code segment and the instruction pointer. Uh, some uh, architectures call this the program counter instead, uh, problem counter instead of instru instruction pointer, but that depends via depending on the CPU architecture. So I have this address. When I call something, the first thing that the, the CPU does is, oh, sorry. 
We also have a correlate uh, segment for the stack. So we have the stack segment and stack pointer that uh, we also keep track of it. But then when I invoke a call, the first thing it do does is place my last position in the stack. So it knows where it, it uh, needs to come back after running the, the, this function. And then jumps to the point uh, it used to address. And so the stack lives normally. And those are the local variables of uh, that function. So when you're ready to, to go back, you need to clear that stack. So when you issue the return function, you return to the previous pointer, uh, actually the next instruction uh, after that pointer, and then pop everything and clean out. Every, uh, the one that the color is responsible for cleaning its own stack. And think about it, if you didn't clean the stack, the sta stack will grow infinitely, and then you eventually will have like a stack overflow, and that's where it came from. Um, that's, that's why we have something, uh, uh, if you need something to l outlive your uh, uh, local variables, you need, for instance, to pass a pointer um, to something, you can't allocate it on stack because it will eventually will be cleared, and so you need to allocate it in the heap. And in order to do that, the Go compiler has uh, a, a feature that we, it's called like scape analysis. And it basically, it analyzes your code and see what needs to outlive the stack. So uh, when the stack's cleared, uh, it, it will still be accessible. Uh, and Escape analysis has several rules. They are implementation dependent. Uh, we shouldn't rely uh, on them that much, but basically those two rules uh, are generic enough for uh, us to state here. So if something is determined at runtime, it will be escaped to the heap because uh, it can be lost in the stack. And pointers usually point to data in the heap. So pointers actually live in the stack, but they will point to something uh, somewhere else. And here I have this very simple example. So uh, this hello escape is a function that has an integer and turns a pointer to it. And the cool Go tooling uh, provides this tool called uh, the tool compile. If you pass dash m to it, it will output the escape analysis for you. And in this case, you notice that a must be accessed afterwards the function has returned, so it moves that to the heap. Um, but just kind of with dash m, you don't have enough information about it, but if you pass dash m twice, actually it prints the reason why uh, it had to escape. So in this case, you see that in this line, um, the second to bottom, like from the return, it decided to escape a. So, and basically, uh, the thing about stack in the heap is that you usually want things to live in the stack because that's fast. Uh, push and pop operations designed to be very fast by, uh, by, by design. Uh, the variables in the stack benefit uh, from data locality. I mean, uh, and that means that usually when you are in a function, everything that you need to complete that function is already in the stack, so it will probably share the same cache lines, uh, which minimize cache misses. And you also have benefits of some hardware optimizations like branch, branch predi prediction. And, but the caveat that size of everything must be known at compile time. Um, to get no more uh, uh, about this, I uh, re highly recommend this article from Segment uh, where they give an example where actually because of escape analysis, they were having worse performance by using pointers than by using uh, uh, like copying data. So it, it kind of, that's why the can uh, is really important in that first sentence. You, maybe you want to minimize data movement, but at, in some circumstance that can be slower because accessing the heap is slower. Um, in the end, uh, it, I can't finish this talk without talking about unsafe. And we, we, in the beginning we talked about how uh, Go made simpler to use pointers, uh, mostly by introducing type safety and removing pointer math. But using the unsafe package, you can actually over, um, 
uh, remove those barriers and actually access the pointers kind of the same way they were, you, they were in C, and that's made for a compatibility purpose. Uh, most of the system calls will need some kind of uh, access through unsafe, and it also allows you to do some kind of uh, conversion between types that otherwise wouldn't be possible. And the thing to keep in mind here is that uh, the types for you, them to be able to be converged to one another, they must share the same uh, underlying structure. In this case, it's a very simple function that takes a floating point in, uh, in 64 bits and converts to an integer. And that, that may be useful, for, for example, to try to test for some bits to see if they're set or not, or maybe doing some kind of uh, analysis on that, uh, on that uh, float. And so most, uh, this is a very uh, complete blog post about it. So if you're dealing with system calls or maybe driver code, and also sometimes you are communicating with the C library using C Go, uh, you probably want to have a look at the unsafe. And so to summarize it all, when do you want to use pointers? If you need to pass, uh, pass by reference semantics, they are not reference per se, like I, I shown to you, they are values, but enables you to use reference semantics. If you need to minimize data copying, and you would like to benchmark that to make sure that also, that actually makes sense. And from that article in, uh, from Segment, they actually advise you to first start with copies, and if things go bad, then you start thinking about pointers, because you're adding uh, a layer of complexity there. Uh, also, the case where zero values may be different than missing value. And of course, lower level interface with drivers, C code, or uh, eventually system calls. That's our, uh, our, those are the use cases for, for pointers. And ju here's a, just an advertisement for a project if you want to explore uh, this, another, uh, it's my implementation of Pac-Man in Go. So some of, one of the examples were based on this. If uh, I really encourage you to give it a try. This is actually a tutorial for the, the Go language. So if you're new to Go, you don't know where to start, this is a very good point. You have the opportunity to try some of those pointer things over there. And that's me. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>